Hello, I'm Colin from eLearn2, and today's lecture is the first lecture about electronic circuits and the periodic table. This chapter also deals with quantum mechanics, so I'll include some additional information in today's class to give you a basic introduction to it. Also, there were some feedback from my colleagues that my lectures are too easy and obvious, so I'll deal with some advanced knowledge I've learned from my school. Before dealing with the electronic structures of an atom, it is helpful to examine atomic spectra, so let's start with light. Determining whether light is a wave or a particle has been a huge conundrum. The main characteristic of determining waves is interference, since this phenomenon cannot happen in particles. After a century of Newton's particle theory being dominant, many evidences proving the wave characteristics of light came up. Young's interference experiment was the first, and it was followed by Fresnel's mathematical calculation of diffraction and polarization. Additionally, Bézieux and Foucault's experiment measured the speed of light in water, and the results showed that it was slower than the speed of light in vacuum. This was not consistent with the explanation of Newton's particle theory. After more experiments, such as the wave generation experiment by Hertz, the light's wave characteristics were proved, but some characteristics of particles were also observed. Let's take focus on the wave nature of light. Light travels through space as a wave, which can be shown as a function of space and time. The physical quantities of the wave function, which is conveyed by light, are electric fields and magnetic fields. Electric fields play a big role in the energy transfer between light and molecules or atoms. The electric fields of light interact with the electric dipole moment and exchanges energy with each other. Now, let's talk about waves. Waves have three primary characteristics, and we'll take focus on two of these. Wavelength, the first characteristic, is the distance between two consecutive crests or trolls, where crests are the highest surface part of a wave crosses are the lowest part. Frequency, or mu, is the number of wave cycles passing through a given point per unit time. According to Planck's equation, frequency determines the energy of light. These two factors are inversely proportional to each other, and we can write this equation to indicate the relationship. Here, c is the speed of light in vacuum. Light visible is only a small proportion of the electromagnetic spectrum. In this diagram, the waves on the left side have larger frequency and shorter wavelength, while the ones on the right side have lower frequency and longer wavelength. Let's first look on the left side. These waves have high energy as they have large frequencies. UV, ultraviolet waves, are part of the radiation emitted from the sun, and in quantum mechanics, Ultraviolet radiation causes the transition of balanced electrons from ground state to excited state. X-rays have higher energy, so they can be absorbed by core electrons and provide the energy for the transition. Now, let's look on the right side. Infrared radiation are observed and used in the vibration of molecules, so IR, infrared radiation spectroscopy, is often called vibrational spectroscopy. Similarly, microwaves are used in molecular rotation, and the spectroscopy involving these waves are called rotational spectroscopy. Lights also have properties as particles, and these were found in these two investigations. The first one was blackbody radiation, which involves the heat radiation of a blackbody box, which has an absorption rate of 1 in the emission absorption relation. The second one was the photoelectric effect, where the electrons bonded to metal atoms escape from them when energy is provided through light. This effect proved three evidences that lights do not act as waves in the perspective of energy. The photoelectric effect proved that the energy of light does not depend on its amplitude, unlike other waves of classical mechanics. Therefore, lights are considered to be generated as a stream of particles called photons and the energy of these photons are given by Planck's equation, which we talked about. 
The atomic spectrum of gaseous elements are different with the continuous spectrum of the light of the sun, and it consists of discrete lines of specific wavelengths. This implied that the energy levels of an atom should be quantized. Now, before looking on the energy levels of an atom, let's get on to the simplest atom model, the hydrogen atom, which played a major role in the development of electronic structure models. Bohr's model of the hydrogen assumed that a hydrogen atom consists of a central proton and electron orbiting around it. Specifically, Bohr was able to express the energy of the atom in terms of the radius of the electron's orbit using these four assumptions. First, an electron cannot have a random orbit, and it can only have a discontinuous orbit called the stationary state. Second, the angular momentum L of the stationary state equals this expression, where n is the principal quantum number and h bar is h divided with 2 pi. Third, electrons get accelerated while orbiting the stationary state, but they do not emit electromagnetic waves. Fourth, electromagnetic waves are only released when transition occurs between two stationary points. By writing the energy equation of the orbiting electron, using terms related to kinetic energy and the Coulomb potential, Bohr obtained the following equation where En is the energy of the electron, or is the Redbird constant, and N is the principal quantum number. Before going further into Bohr's model, it is important to notice three points. In setting up this model, Bohr defines zero energy as the point at which the proton and electron are completely separated or their distance R is infinite. As you see in this potential energy graph, energy has to be observed to reach the state, and electrons of an atom must have negative energy. This can also be predicted by calculating the Coulomb potential of electrons. Second, the hydrogen's electron is ordinarily in its ground state with the lowest energy, for which n equals 1. When an electron absorbs enough energy, it moves to a higher excited state, and this is important when you learn about atomic orbitals. Third, when an excited electron releases energy in the form of light, it drops back to a lower energy state of the ground state. The energy released in this process equals to the energy difference of the two stationary states. Using this point, we can obtain this equation of the energy released. If we divide both sides with h and change some signs, the equation can be written in this form. Additionally, using the equation we learned previously, lambda times nu equals z, we can change the equation again to this form. This is called the Rydberg formula, and here the reciprocal of wavelength is called the wave's number, and it acts as an important factor of quantum mechanics. However, Bohr's energy expression had problems when extended to other atoms. For example, when the energy of hydrogen was compared to the energy of helium plus, the energy of the cation became 4.0016 times hydrogen, which did not match the theoretical value, 4. The reason why this experimental value was bigger was soon revealed. Electrons also have mass, and they actually orbit the center of mass between the electron and proton. Here, we can use an alternative term for electron's mass. Reduced mass. Reduced mass can be calculated in the following equation. This is the end of today's lecture. Quantum mechanics is indeed complicated, and I'll divide this chapter into three parts to make sure the class doesn't become so boring. I'll keep including extra information in this chapter's lectures so that you can fully understand the basics of quantum mechanics before you start learning it professionally. Next time, we'll continue learning this chapter before we go on to chapter 7, so make sure you subscribe to the channel, leave a like, and turn on the notifications.